What's up, everyone, and welcome to week six of the What's Your Why series. Uh, I'm your host, T, and yes, I'm still in the closet. I'm actually going to move a little bit so you cannot see too much of the stuff <laughs> that me and my wife got going on. But uh, ain't nothing nasty, nothing like that. We just got some perfume and some cologne and stuff, you know, because we got to look good and smell good you know, for each other and then you know, we pull out and all that good stuff. But <laughs> today's episode uh, features none other than Pastor Rob Coburn, who is the senior pastor of the Summit Dover Church in Dover, Ohio. Um, when I reached out to Pastor uh, Coburn, man, he was one of the first ones to just say, yes, I would love to do it. I, I love what you're doing. I want to be a part. Um, and you'll see this conversation, man. He is just a phenomenal and an awesome man of God. Um, he's leading that church, man, up in Dover, Ohio, and doing great things. Uh, one of the um, things that I love the most about our conversation is that I, I, I understood that he was a business owner at the age of 16, I believe. And man, how many people do you know or have, or have come in contact with who was a business owner that young um, and then sold the business uh, to create a new one? You know, he is a very brilliant, a very smart man of God. Um, he is very inspiring and very inspirational. And I pray that you guys are blessed by this conversation. I pray that you guys are blessed by this series. I pray that you guys are blessed by everything that we're doing with this What's Your Why series. I pray that you guys have been blessed by all the conversations so far. Um, I feel like, you know, this is a great lineup of preachers, a great lineup of men of God who are hungry about the things of God, who are hungry about this stuff. I'm excited, man. I, I, I'm just so humble and... Um, and honored to have this opportunity to talk to so many pastors, talk to so many leaders, talk to so many um, people um, who have really shown just true, genuine Christian love um, in this thing. And I thank God that, you know, there are some true, genuine, authentic Christians in this world who truly love people and truly love helping people. Um, as you guys have seen on Facebook and, and all on the social media channels, I share a lot of these pastors, their services on Sunday mornings. Uh, whenever they go live because I want people to see that you know these men of God are actually out here doing the, the things of Christ you know doing what they're supposed to be doing um, and not only that but I want you guys to be able to see um, exactly everything that these men of God are doing you know he has a podcast a summit up podcast and he also has has other ministries that are very influential and are very impactful for the kingdom of God so uh, without further ado I want you guys to get this um, this content. I want you guys to get this conversation. It is so deep. It is so enriching. And it is dope. Please enjoy this conversation between me and Pastor Coburn here on One Faith Radio. <laughs> I am I am so excited. So so I just turned forty a little oh, wow. a little while ago, Happy and uh, I know I don't look like it, but it's it's good. But uh, <laughs> so I just turned forty, and I want to be honest with everybody is that I struggled for the longest time knowing my why. Mm -hmm. So at the age of sixteen, I started my first company. I bought a company wow. at 20. Wow. I ran that company for 13 years. And, uh, and then it, God called me into ministry and it was a weird kind of ministry. I began helping missionaries around the world, raise money and, and learn how to learn how to tell their story and learn how to get out there and, and really market themselves. I've, I've studied marketing my whole life, but anyway, so, so throughout that journey, God was shaping me. You know, it says in, it says in scripture that, uh, we are, all of our destiny was written in a book before the foundation of the world. We get that. Um, I've just been walking it out. And, and so my why for all those years of owning my own companies was a bottom line number and self-sufficiency for my family. Right. Um, and, uh, and so my focus was that. That's my why. I wanted to take care of my family. I wanted to build a good business. And, and it all worked out great. Um, but I have to say, you know, moving over to the shift to 40 years old and and really uh, reevaluating some things in my life. Mm -hmm. uh, before, like whenever I was called into ministry, it was a ministry to serve other people and helping them advance the kingdom of God. Right. And, uh, and that, that was, that was my, my interest. That was what, what I was doing in the moment. As I became the lead pastor here at the summit in Dover, Ohio, uh, my, my why is this. Jesus said in John 17, as he was praying, he said, I'll, I'll just read it to you. He says, Jesus spoke these words, lifted up his eyes uh, to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may also glorify you as you have been as you have given authority over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as have been given him. And this is eternal life that they may know you, 
the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. My why is to get to know him better every single day, to get to know him, to know about him, to know his movements, to feel his presence, to engage with him on a daily basis and make it a relationship that is so highly, so highly loved by me that it beats anything else on the planet. Right. And in doing that, in doing that, then my why shifts to helping other people get that same thing. And so it was interesting whenever I was born again, whenever I was young, I grew up in a, in a Baptist household and, and uh, now I'm Pentecostal, but I grew up in a Baptist household. I wouldn't change that for a moment, but I had great grounding. And one of the things that, that I knew is that I knew that God loved me, but I didn't understand that. Mm. And so it was, it was more about doing the things that needed to be done. And whenever I was born again, the gospel was about me. As I became older, the gospel became about everybody else. Mm. And I think that, that that shift is a shift of maturity. It's a shift of growing in the Lord and a relationship with him so that we can, th this world is not about us. Um, right. This is about what, what other people have to give and how do we draw that out of them? And so my why is to get to know him to the best of my ability on the time I have on this planet and to help other people connect to who he is. Cause he's good. He, he looks at us with an unconditional love from every aspect with no expectation that we're right. going to do anything. Right. He just provides it all free. And the world is crying out for three things. I believe mm -hmm. the world is crying out for significance transcendence and community yeah those are those are the big three they're not original to me but i i list them on everything i do is that every single person on the planet wants to be significant we look around the world today uh all the noise all the all the craziness going on they're searching for significance and they're going to find it in a movement they're going to yeah. find it in something yeah uh, number two transcendence the the we are beings that need to feel fulfilled by being a part of something bigger than who we are. Yeah. And so the mass of society is trying to find their way into a movement. They're trying to find their way into something. And then the third one is community. We, we need to have community to thrive as human beings. And, right. and, uh, and I, I think for the longest time I failed at that um, because it was about me. And so I, I maybe had significance in my own eyes, but I didn't have community and I didn't have transcendence. And, uh, and so as I've, as I've matured in life, I've been able to open my mind and open my heart to those around us so that we can help them experience those three things. Mm -hmm. And when a person who is just searching in life, maybe they're, maybe they're searching in drugs, maybe they're searching in porn, whatever it is, they're searching. Everybody's searching for these three things. Right. The thing is, the church and the gospel is the answer. Mm -hmm. The gospel, number one, but then church brings the transcendence and community into what we need. You find significance in the gospel. Right. And, uh, and you find transcendence in what Jesus called us to do. Uh, you've got to find community somewhere. And I think that the, that's the church's call. Exactly. And, uh, and, and what I'm believing for is that there's an awakening that's about to happen, not just in, not just in this country, but around the planet. But I'm focused here because this is where I'm at. Right. And we've got missionaries around the world and, and I help them. We sow into those ministries, but my ministry's here. And I believe in just our small city that we're in, that God's going to send an awakening that's going to bring people to the understanding that there is a, there is a, a person that all of this is contained in. Mm -hmm. And he came to this earth and he died so that we didn't have to, and that we could have a life on this planet that was filled with power and authority and to restore everything that man had lost, Jesus came to this planet. And so my why is how I relate with the Lord and how I can help others relate with him. I love that. Because those three things that you, that you um, pointed out, significance, transcendence, and community, you know, that is spot on with what is going on in the world today. Because we are searching for significance, we are searching for transcendence, and we are searching for a community. Um, people, especially when you look at everything that's going on as of late with um, racial tensions in this in this country, you know, we Black Lives Matter movement um, is birthed out of you know a sense of um, equality. Um, it's it's birthed out of that, and then you know, as we dig a little deeper into the actual organization, you know, we find some things that it gets a little muddy. <laughs> but yeah. you know, we find some things that you know 
what we understand fully what they're all about. Um, and to be honest, I mean, I, me and my cousin, um, Elder Omar Pickett, um, he's actually, um, his episode is airing today. Um, we did a, a talk, we, we pretty much talked about this. Um, we talked about the difference between the Black Lives Matter movement and organization and how it can become an idol if you're not careful. Um, and not only that, but we talk about how, you know, the churches, I would say the rise of this movement came out of the church's lack of uh, responsibility in, you know, leading the cause of, um, of, of, of bringing about um, equality um, when, in, in every facet of that word and every facet of that meaning. Because, you know, we're in a significant time where, you know, we should be much further along. Um, the church should have a much lar a larger voice than what we have today. But it's like we are seeing so much insignificance um, in the voice of the church, um, mainly because of, you know, I feel like it's, it's definitely the enemy's play at hand um, to try to silence the church because he knows just how powerful the church can be if we're all unified. But at the same time, I feel that, you know, um, a lot of it has to do with the sins of the church um, and how it has kind of um, lessened or de <laughs> de um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, it's kind of less in our voice because too many people don't want to listen to pastors who um, are hypocrites or to people who don't, you know, they don't uphold the banner of Jesus Christ in the way they should. And I think that's one of the reasons why we see so much going on in the world today. But I believe just like you believe, I believe that there is um, a revival. I believe that there is an awakening that's coming that people are eventually going to see like, Hey, you know, we need God, you know, we need God in all areas of this thing. Um, if we want to see Black Lives Matter, we can't do this movement without God. If we want to see, you know, other things happen in this country, we can't do it without God. Uh, we can try. We can come up with some movement, some type of um, stance and, and bring unity in that um, area. But, you know, I, I'm a firm believer is that, you know, if God isn't in the midst of it, um, if he's not involved in it, then it's not blessed and it's not going to flourish and it's not going to prosper. You know, it's always going to be um, contingent upon those factors. So. I love it. That's spot on. That is spot on. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what's your um, testimony for salvation? Well, hey, I, like I said, I grew up in a Baptist household. I remember kneeling by my mom and dad's bed mm -hmm. uh, whenever I was five years old. And, and I just I was convicted on, uh, during a service and, and wanting, uh, wanting to know the answers. And thank the Lord, I was blessed with parents who who knew to connect me to the person who had all the answers, Good. Uh, who had all the transformation, who would be with me 40, you know, 80 years later, whatever he, he was going to be with me and, and to start that relationship. So I was born again in, in a, in a Baptist environment and, and with a, uh, a divine destiny mm -hmm. uh, that, that was set in motion. And, and man, I am so excited that today I can still look back on that, that time and, and, realize the the shift that took place yeah i found significance transcendence and community although all those things i didn't realize whenever i was born again but we get all of that we get it implanted in us on that birthday and man now i'm drawn on that every day i'm i'm seeking that that power that comes through acknowledging and and having a relationship with jesus and so um so yeah i would i i experienced this young and you know oftentimes through through high school and college, you know, people would ask me to share my testimony. I said, mine's boring, guys. <laughs> like, I, I haven't experienced half the stuff the world has. But what I do know is, is that the Lord has, just as he does with everybody, the Lord has his hand on people. He had his hand on me and protected me from a lot of, a lot of craziness, but has allowed me to walk in a, in a relationship and grow over the years just to mature and, uh, and figure out who I am. I, I believe that the, the problem that you just described in the church uh, is, is a pandemic. It, yeah. It's, it's a pandemic that's happening. And, and so how, how we relate to those around us, it's not about getting them in the door of our facility. Mm -hmm. Believe me, I I've done marketing for, for years, decades. And, uh, and I know how to get a crowd to move. That's totally fine. But the, the goal is instead of getting a crowd to move in the doors of our church, we need to be focused on getting the crowd that's in our church to move outside the church. I love that. And to begin to love those people around us. And so uh, we can run marketing campaigns and we can do all that and draw, draw tons of people to us. Mm -hmm. If we're not going to empower them to go back out, we might as well not. 
mm. because we don't want to bring them into a, to a stagnant place or to a place of not being equipped. So what we've done at the summit is we, I, I've just been on a kick of talking about dreams and, and different things. And, um, but anyway, we have a dream board and, and the dream focuses on how do we help other people uh, achieve their dreams. And Zig Ziglar always said uh, that if you'll get what you want, if you help other people get what they want. And, and so we've been focused on that at the summit. We've seen some great things happen, but it all revolves around that relationship that started for me whenever I was a little kid. And, yeah. and I knew that the Holy Spirit was drawing me. I didn't know, I couldn't express that obviously, but I knew that I had to make this move. I knew I was compelled to do it. And so I'm just believing that there are thousands and tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, even in this country, that are, are on the precipice of making that decision and realizing their significance, all the way from little kids, all the way up to, to 90 and 100 year olds, uh, that, that the inside, they're, they're stirring, inside yeah. they're stirring. And, and if the church is willing to go outside the doors and to share what God has done for them, we will see a transformation in this country, not to a movement, but to a mission. And mm. the mission is what he's called us to do. That's good. And it, it just makes me think about this time that we're in. You know, it's very interesting that, you know, God would um, allow us to go through this season of a pandemic to where, you know, he kind of shut the doors of the church for a period of time so that we could go outside of the church and use different means to reach people. Um, even though we weren't allowed to go outside for a significant point of time, part of time, and, and we had to stay within our, uh, our own, you know, houses and whatnot. But, you know, we are blessed with the, the gifts of technology. You know, we can reach people, um, we can reach the masses with technology uh, much quicker than we can with, you know, going door to door and knocking on um, everyone's door and, and saying, hey, you want to know about Jesus? So, <laughs> so it's very interesting that we're in this time and this season to where, you know, it's like God kind of forced us to, um, to leave the church and be the church and and take the church out with us. Um, I remember in um, one of my um, seminary classes, uh, we were talking about um, we were talking about uh, the the marks of a good church um, and what really makes a church really significant and stands out is its impact in the community and that you know its impact within um, its own church. If we as a people can, you know, influence our churches, influence the members within our churches to be leaders, um, then those leaders will eventually in turn go out and turn other people into leaders. You know, they'll lead other people, they'll lead people outside of um, the church and in their communities. And I think that churches have to, um, I don't, I'm not going to pick on all churches and say all churches aren't doing it, but I think that, you know, many churches have to get back to that model or that philosophy that, you know, if we begin in our own home, in our own houses, if we begin in our own churches, you know, you know, begin to beget leaders within our churches, you know, we will see more of that that you're talking about, you know, people going outside of the four walls of the church um, and leading movements, leaving, leading things that can draw more people in. Um, that, of course, that, you know, leads to church growth and all that good stuff. But, you know, it's, it, it goes beyond that. You know, we're, mm -hmm. it's not just about growing your church or anything like that. It's more about um, ma being an impact making yep. a difference in people's lives, making a difference in, um, in, 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 air, in the situation. You know, you never know what anyone is going through and, and you sending the leader out to do something, you know, it could impact their day and just make <laughs> a crappy situation um, great. It could turn that lemon into lemonade. So yeah, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm with that 100%. Yeah, uh, Galatians 5.1 says, stand fast therefore in the liberty by which Christ has made us free and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage some translations say slavery in there, but I think that, that this bondage that is a, has been upon the church mm -hmm. has been a bondage of apathy, and, mm -hmm. and I'm not talking every church. I'm talking the, the, the issues that we deal with that we fight against is the mm -hmm. apathy that we can come together. Do not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, right? We know that, mm -hmm. but that we could come together and not be impacting to our community. One of the best questions that was ever asked me was before I took over the church here in Dover, uh, a, a pastor friend of mine said, now my question for you is, are you going to build a church that it, are you going to lead a church that if it closed tomorrow, the city wouldn't even notice? Mm. Uh, or are you going to lead a church that if you close down, the city would be trying to figure out how to open you back up? Wow. And, and that's our goal is that it, how do we create a kingdom impact in our region? And, and I believe with technology, like you said, we can, we can reach the world, but if we're not willing to reach the world outside of our door and love on those kids in our neighborhood and, 
and do those things, even in the midst of a pandemic, if we're not willing to do that, then what are we here for? What are we actually doing? Or is the gospel so much about us that we've forgotten the world? I like that. And it makes, it makes so much of a um, significance. Like the church should be very um, impactful in that nature. You know, people should want to come to the church for, of course, salvation and all that good stuff, but for, you know, some of the basic necessities. Like one of the things I love the most about um, the church um, with, when the pandemic and everything hit, you know, I saw a lot of churches, you know, start the uh, relief efforts. They started um, by going out, handing out masks, handing out care packages, uh, started by, you know, partnering with different um, food shelters to start handing out food to individuals who, um, who couldn't get um, meals or, or and started um, helping out uh, much of our um, senior citizens in the church. You know, I feel that, you know, ministry is definitely happening. Um, I, I do wish that it, it would be happening across all the boards. You know, it, it makes me wonder, like, you know, if all churches kind of bought into that, you know, and, and what you're saying, buy into all of us being, becoming together, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves, but coming together um, uh, under that same umbrella, under that same notion, then I believe that um, I believe that we, we definitely would have made a much greater impact. And I love that point that you said um, about creating a, a, a a kingdom impact that, you know, focuses on the community, um, mm -hmm. creating that impact to where the community is like, okay, the church is closed. We need to do whatever we can to get this church back open because this church is really being an impact to our community. And I think that you see that in a lot of um, churches today. Um, uh, I hate to say it too, but you see that with a lot of the larger churches too. A lot of the larger churches do have a, a good, strong impact in our communities. Um, mm -hmm. and, I, and I love the fact that um, a lot of the larger churches um, have reached out and started helping out some of the smaller churches in the area. Um, mm -hmm. It's a community effort. It's a communal effort. You know, we all are in this together, um, helping it, helping each other out. I love seeing stuff like that because I, I feel like, you know, th those type of churches and, and those type of ministries and pastors, they get it. They understand mm -hmm. the, the significance of the time and the significance of everything that's going on. So. Yeah. And I, I love the name of your radio show, One Faith. You know, it's one faith, it's one voice. It's really, if we if we believe scripture that we teach every week, it's one church. It is. Uh, we, we're one church. The, the church in the city in which I am right now and you are right now is one church. Exactly. And uh, it, may have, it may have many different brands and maybe different flavors and, and all that stuff, but we're one church. And it's time for the church to rise up and do what we've been called to do and that is to have one voice in our community, and that's the voice of love, that we can minister love to our community in whatever facet. I truly believe uh, that every church has a specific assignment in the city in which it is, mm -hmm. and that it, it, whatever that assignment is need to be, needs to communicate love to the community. Mm -hmm. And so, so it's going to look completely different by the 75 churches in our city, but we all need to have one voice, and that is distributing love in whatever facet that is that God has blessed us with and anointed us with and called us with in this hour. But if we're, if we're not putting that out to the community, I believe we're missing the essential call that he has for us to be one church in our community. I love that. Um, I was speaking to a pastor yesterday um, and there's a quote out there that says, you know, the most segregated time of, of the week is Sunday mornings. Um, and he kind of redirected my, my thought process around that because, of course, you know, we think about, you know, you know, the churches being separate, uh, separated based off of races and different things like that. But, you know, one of the things he said was, you know, you know, the church having those different type of flavors and different things like that, it isn't a problem to him because, you know, like you said, everyone has their own flavor. Everyone has their own different style. Um, people may love the Pentecostal style of church. I love the Pentecostal style of church. Actually, I love a blend of the Pentecostal style of church and the non-denomination um, style of church. I love both. But at the same time, you know, that may not be the same flavor for a lot of people. You know, a lot of yeah. our, our older saints, you know, they want to go to church dressed up uh, from head to toe and want that whole experience, you know, of waking up Sunday morning, going to Sunday school and, and going straight from Sunday school into the service after the service, going right back to service on uh, Sunday, you know, you know, they want that, they want that experience. Um, and I believe that, you know, like you said, we can be a unified church if we all kind of got together on the same page, understood that we're all different. Yes. Uh, I believe that every single pastor has, has their own call. You know, your call is, is, is significant to your community, to your church that you pastor. Um, your call may be different from um, my pastor's call. 
his call is to his community and is to um, his church. And even though our calls are different, we still serve the same God. We still serve and answer to mm -hmm. the same God. And yep. I believe that God did that for a reason. He's strategic <laughs> in all his planning and all his ways. And it, it is my prayer that, you know, with One Faith, the radio show, um, podcast, um, and, and I, I want this to, to come and to turn into a ministry, not a church, but a ministry that can help people. But I, I pray that, you know, it can be a vehicle to help drive some more of that change, some more of that, um, that unifying efforts. Because I do believe, as you said, we are one church. We may have different flavors. <laughs> we may have different styles and, and different tastes, but we are all one church. We're, we're, we're all one. We all love the same God and we worship the same God. Um, at least, <laughs> at least some of us do, but you know, we all have that same, um, that same motive. Um, and it, and it talks to, and it kind of talks more to, um, Ephesians four, where Paul is talking about that. You know, we all have different spiritual gifts. We all have different things that we bring to the, to the body of Christ. Um, mm -hmm. We shouldn't use our spiritual gifts to divide, but you, we should use our spiritual gifts to um, unite, to upbuild the body of King, the body of Christ. And that's what it's all about at the end of the day, you know. Um, my spiritual gift may be different from yours, but I mean, as long as we're pointing people to Christ at the end of the day, that's all that matters. Yeah. And, and I, I think that the thing that sort of stifles this uh, in many situations is the comparison trap. Yeah. And that is, you know, looking at someone else in another denomination in your city or whatever, oh, they're the big one there. What it doesn't matter. They're the small, one. whatever it is, the comparison trap limits the effectiveness of unity. Yeah. And when we compare ourselves against someone else or with someone else, we uh, immediately we eliminate unity because yeah. we're, we're, we're divided at that point because we're thinking that we're at different levels. Listen, we're one church. I've got gifts that you don't have. You got gifts that I don't have, but we have to be, we have to be equal in our love for the Lord and equal in the calling in which he's called us. And if we do that in love, we're going to, we're going to see a revival that we've never seen on this planet before. Right. And I believe it takes the leaders like you uh, and, and other leaders that are saying, let's come together, let's get one voice together, and let's love our let's love our world. Nothing is needed more in this society than love. Right. And through love, we find liberty in Him. And so, man, it's just it's so exciting to be a part of this show and to, and to hear what you're doing, um, and just just encounter that. It's awesome. Yeah, it is. I appreciate that, and definitely, uh, it's like what the Bible says: where the Spirit is, there is liberty, and that's. What is, is what we were, we're trying to accomplish, you know, bringing the spirit, bringing that, that spirit of liberty um, mm -hmm. in this country because it's needed. You know, I, I see a lot of people um, from my race, you know, they won't know dealings with, with white people. And it breaks my heart because it's like, you know, there's only a few subset of people that are just, you know, terrible people. Um, and, you know, we still have to love them. We still have to pray for them. We still have to, you know, show that partial, um, partial love towards them as the Bible talks about. Um, but, you know, it, 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 we're in a time where we need to really push for re racial reconciliation. We need to push for people coming together, um, despite how much we don't want to come together right now. You know, we still mm -hmm. have to push forward because, you know, there is hope, you know, when we all get to heaven, you know, there's not going to be a, a white section in heaven, a black section in heaven or, you know, a Hispanic section. You know, we're not going to be separated by class systems. You're not going to be none of that there. We all are going to be together in one, worshiping God, and that's what it's all together. That's what it's all about. You know, we we're trying to build. You know, I won't say build it here as in heaven, but you know, that's you know similar to what I'm trying to what I'm trying to do. You know, we're trying to show that you know it's this is what heaven is going to look like. You know, we <laughs> I joke um, all the time. Um, someone told me that you know we don't know what heaven will look like. Uh, we don't know who would be up there, which we don't. We don't know who will be up there. But I know one thing: there are people there who are there already, who were black, <laughs> who were white, who were Hispanic, and that right. they're there now, and they're um, embodying the, the, um, the body of Christ. Uh, mm -hmm. they're, actually, they're accurately depicting the body of Christ. So, yeah, right. I, I love it. I love it. Yeah. Yeah, you know, one of the things that, that you mentioned there through this thought in there, so I'm just going to say it, but mm -hmm. where there is not unity, there is the enemy. Yeah. Um, and, and so, you know what, there are so many things I don't understand about about your culture and about how you live and, and all that. That's okay. If we're, if we're united in Christ and we have one spirit, one mind, right? We're, we're going together. We're going after this. I'm going to want to understand more about you. Right. And you're going to want to understand more about me, but where we're separated, if I said, I don't want to know any more about you, I, I don't want to, you know, 
I, Thomas, I don't, I don't care. I don't want to talk to you anymore. Instantly, there is the enemy in the midst of the camp. Yeah. And, and man, the, the unity that comes from just a conversation or, or whatever is, uh, is, is where the Lord thrives. And it all comes through relationship. The right. enemy wants to disrupt family. He wants to disrupt relationship. And in, in the person who allows that to happen in their life, there is a complete open doorway for the enemy to wreck everything else. You're right. And, uh, and you were talking about the, the movement, you know, as I was reading all the, the standards that they have on their website, mm -hmm. uh, the one that stuck out to me is that we don't acknowledge traditional family. Yeah. Um, you know what? It, that is the problem with our society. I, I know you haven't gone back and watched any other videos. You saw Isaac Davis, which was pretty cool. But, yeah. um, but you know, I preached, I preached the, a couple weeks before about the pandemic of, of uh, paternity. Mm -hmm. that, that we don't have fathers. The scripture says you will have a thousand teachers, tens of thousands of teachers, all these teachers, but you don't have fathers. And we need the family to be together as the church, but also the family as the family unit that fathers can speak to their kids, that we can lead our families to, to a knowledge of, of a love that never lets go. And that, that just one point, says, man, there's something wrong. There's not unity there. We don't discredit family. That was the, the unit that God ordained on the planet whenever he created it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and we just need to, we need to acknowledge that they're, they're crying out for those three things, significance, transcendence, and community. They are. Um, and I love that point. Um, it's so, it's, it's so, it's so prevalent because you, you made me think about um, Dr. Vody Bauckham. He, he wrote a book about um, biblical manhood, uh, spiritual manhood, and how fathers are um, basically charged to lead their families. You know, the pastor is the pastor of his church, but he is not the one that's going to, you know, lead, his, lead your family into heaven. Like that, that falls on the responsibility of the father. And when we as Christians really get that through our thick heads, <laughs> yeah. you know, the pastor is just the pastor of the church, you know, and the father is really the shepherd of his, um, of his family, you know, we will start seeing more change. And, and to your point with, uh, with the Black Lives Matter movement and what they're doing um, by um, somewhat disbanding the, um, the, the, the male head of the family, you know, it, it, it is disheartening and it is eye opening because, you know, we, we, as Christians, we know that it's, it's a very important to have fathers in the household. Um, I come from a two-parent household. I, and I was actually on a, um, a podcast panel not too long ago um, where we were talking about, um, you know, relationships and, um, and talking about um, um, different things, uh, different aspects as far as uh, whether people should feel um, protected, women should feel protected um, uh, with, with their males or not. And it was so shocking that I was honestly, I believe I was the only one, the only male that came from a two parent household that was on the, pan, on the panel. And I don't, I don't want to say like it showed or anything like that, but you know, it was, it was alarming and it was kind of disheartening because, you know, we have so many people in the society that um, grew up without fathers. And because of that, they are suffering with um, a lot of problems and issues today because the father wasn't in the household. Um, and it doesn't mean that, you know, they became, you know, terrible individuals or anything like that. No, a lot of people um, grew up to be great individuals. I know a lot of people who didn't have a father in the household and probably doing a lot better than I am. <laughs> but at the end of the day, you know, the whenever you talk to them or whenever you uh, have that conversation with them, they always go back to, you know, I wish my father was there or I wish that I had some sort of relationship with my father. And that in and of itself is important. It's very important in this society. Uh, mm -hmm. We need a lot more strong men to step up and just be men, be fathers. Uh, we need men to just step up to that responsibility and say, you know what? I made this baby. I made this decision to, um, to, to lay down with this um, woman. I'm going to, um, you know, raise my child. I'm going to do what I can. Um, it doesn't mean that you have to get, get married immediately if you make that mistake um, out, outside of confines of marriage. But, you know, you want to do your part. And I feel like if men would step up in that area and do their part, we would see a transformation in this country. We would see a transformation in people. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I just want to say thank you for for uh, and being that voice and being a father and those things. I just want to say thank you for that. Oh, thank you, <laughs> thank you, thank you. So, um, keep on chugging along, man. This is going good. So, um, so what? Mm, what motivated you to pursue ministry? 
Well, I knew uh, whenever I was a teenager that I had a call in my life. And I, like I said, I, I did the entrepreneur thing. I, I did everything I probably could to, to create, a, create a career and a good life for us. And, and we still benefit from that. But I began to serve everywhere. One of the things that my dad taught me, since we're talking about dads here, but um, one of the things that my dad taught me was is that you serve how someone needs you to serve them, not how you want to serve them. That's good. And, uh, and my spiritual father, same thing. That was both of their, without even communicating specifically that statement, that's what they demonstrated for me, is that you serve how someone needs to be served and you don't serve them how you want to because there's days I get up and I don't want to serve. Right. But I serve because that person needs me to serve that way. And so um, my calling into ministry was whenever I was a teenager, but I really didn't walk into it until uh, after I was 20 years old. We, we, uh, my wife had a child before we were married mm-hmm. and, uh, and brought, that in, brought that child into the marriage. And uh, when she was three years old, she passed away. Oh, wow. And I think at that point in my life, not only through the grieving and all that stuff, but I think at that point in my life, my life shifted in perspective. Mm. Um, and, and it wasn't just about serving people, you know, how, how they needed to be served in the world. It became, you know what the Lord, the Lord has called me to serve people the way that they need to be served in the church, outside the church, every aspect of my life. And, and that needs to be my focus from here on out. And so I, I believe that my call was early on, but I didn't walk in it until my twenties, uh, and began to serve in, like you said, serving in church and serving all over. Um, and, and I believe that I'm where I'm at today because I did that through the whole process, mm-hmm. through my growing process. I, n- I never looked at my business as something that took me out of ministry. I, I looked at my business as a means to minister. Right. And, uh, and in doing that throughout all the years, um, now I'm the senior pastor of a church, but um, that's just, that's just the, the result of where I am today in ministry. But the ministry started a long time ago. And I, I just want to encourage everybody out there. I want you to, to take a moment and check your motives of how you're serving people. If you're serving them in the way that they need to be served, you're, you're doing what Jesus did all across. It said, it said he, he healed people. He, he loved on them. He preached. He, he did all that stuff. It wasn't because that was his every day he woke up and that's what he wanted to do. He was human just as we are yet without sin. But that he served them because that's what they needed to find freedom. Mm. and uh and and to be delivered from sickness and disease and all that stuff and so we have to model that on the earth and you know when we talk about inside the walls or outside the walls that's totally strictly a view of how you serve yourself exactly. if you're if you're only going to serve inside the walls then it's probably more about how you want to serve if you're going to serve the world around you it's because they need you to serve them and you're going to do whatever it takes to to help them come to know who he is yeah. So um, that's, that's my, my background for ministry is, is not that, that huge. But what I do know is that service and, you know, one of my great mentors is, is just an amazing guy. His name is Tommy Reed. He's in Buffalo, New York. And, uh, and, and Tommy, Bishop Tommy Reed said one time, and he wrote it in a book. I have a publishing company. He wrote it in a book that we published. Yeah. But, but he talked about how Jesus came with a towel and not a crown. Mm-hmm. And man, I, I want to see that. I want to I want somebody to write about me one day and say, the reason why, the reason why I'm writing this story about my interaction with Rob is because he served me with a towel mm. and, uh, he was a King. He's a King that is, is definitely valid. But yeah. what I knew him from was that his kingly authority came because he served me with a towel. I love that. It, it reminds me of, um, one of the ordinances in our uh, in the Church of God in Christ is foot washing. Um, I don't I don't know if you're familiar with that, but mm-hmm. it's basically yep. um, yeah, it's it's basically um, something that Jesus did um, right before he went to um, right before he um, what went through um, gosh, went through with, with the crucifixion yes, yeah. uh, of his walk. Um, basically, he sat down at his disciples' feet and washed their feet, and it for us in the Church of God in Christ. Um, we observe that ordinance mainly because um, of the aspect of servant leadership. Um, everything that you're talking about, that, that is spot on to servant leadership. You know, it humbles us. It keeps us, um, it keeps us grounded. It keeps us to where we're reminded daily that, you know, we're doing this thing 
for other people. We're not trying to get big headed. We're not trying to do this because we want a big name at the end of the day, or we want some kind of fame or glory. It's about serving the people that God has entrusted us with. It's about serving those who are around us, um, being, being what they need in that moment. Um, that's what it's all about. And that's, to me, honestly, I take that to heart because um, that's what ministry is for me. I want to help people. Uh, I'm, I always say that. I always want to, always want to help people. I, I want to, I want a, a business. I want my own business, but I don't know how I can um, legit make money off of helping people if, <laughs> if I'm constantly giving out the revenue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> But, um, but it's like, it's like I, I have that vision, that dream to do stuff like that. And it's like, you know, I always wanted to help people because it's in my heart. You know, you always want to be some type of um, help or some type of answer to someone's need. You never know what someone is going through, what someone may need. And it just so happens that if you have that particular um, gift in your heart to help someone, you know, God may speak to you to give someone a call or sow a seed in someone's life. And you don't know how far that seed may go. You don't know how far that call may go. But you do know that because you did that, because you answered the call of, of God in that moment, you met a need. Um, and that's what it's all about. You know, as servant leaders, as leaders in general, you know, we should be humble, uh, be servants, and, and honestly, just be those people that God has, um, has, has called us to be. Jesus was the greatest example, as you said, as being a servant leader. He served first before he did anything else. He showed us the way, then went and died on the cross for our sins to be the way. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. Yeah. And, and think about this. Jesus said, I only do what I see the Father do. I only say what I hear the Father say. Yep. So that means that when he was washing their feet, it was the Father's heart. Yep. It was the Father's inkling uh, that was coming through him because he only did what he saw the Father do. So the Father in essence, was washing their feet. And, and the more we spend time with the Lord, the more we connect in his presence, the more we, we understand his heart, the more our heart begins to look like his heart. And when we serve people the way they need to be served, it reflects a father who loves them. Even though we may not know them, I may not know you, but if I can serve you in any way, I want to do that because that's what the father would do. Exactly. That's exactly what he would do. And we should have the same heart as the father, especially mm -hmm. since his spirit is within us. So mm -hmm. yeah, I love it. I love it. So um, I did. I did kind of <laughs> skip your um, your your call the ministry. Uh, your call to ministry. I think I skipped that question, but you kind of answered it. So I skipped yep. it. Yeah. over it. Um, so what motivates you now to continue in ministry? Uh, I know you you talked about what motivated you to pursue it, but what what keeps you going now? Man, I love to see transformation. I love to see people get in touch with 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 the love that they couldn't find on this earth and. It is so not just that, but I mean, just the, the transformation in people's lives when they when they're in his presence, when they connect with who he is and when they connect with family, local, loving family or even global church family. We're a part of the Foursquare uh, four square denomination. And man, our global family is so awesome to hang out with. We get to hang out a couple of times a year mm -hmm. and it, it is just an awesome thing to be a part of. So I think that the motivation today same as before, but but even greater than than my original motivation was, man, it's just great to see transformation in people. Right. And even in myself, man, the stuff that I the the amount that I've changed through this whole pandemic as a leader, as a as a dad, as I mean, just every as a husband, every yeah. part of who I am has changed. And that excites me because uh you know, Hebrews thirteen eight tells us that Jesus is the same today, yesterday, and forever. He doesn't change. But man, he wants us to change to be to, toward his image. Right. And I, I'm trying to, I'm trying to find things that are, that are maybe rooted in pride or whatever, and, and just change who I am so I can be more like him. Mm -hmm. So that transformation is the key for my ministry today. I love that. And it kind of goes with my heart too, because when I was doing campus ministry, that's one of the things I loved the most about doing campus ministry was seeing the transformation in the, uh, in the hearts of the college students. Yeah, um, I'm I'll, I'm turning 30 this year, so I'm I'm not that old, <laughs> but um, I, I'm not too far removed from being a college student. And I just love I remember um, being in college and, you know, I, I launched a, a campus ministry and just being able to just see, you know, those kids transform. Um, I was a kid myself, so I mean, I don't know why I'm saying those kids, but seeing my <laughs> friends transform <laughs> and just become, you know, different individuals, become more um, like Christ. 
um, for them to actually listen, think that I was worth <laughs> worthy enough to listen to. You know, I thought that that was pretty dope. And then even uh, recently, um, I was a campus minister at um, NC State, um, and we had um, we had a great ministry. Uh, they're still going strong, uh, and I love it. I mean, I love that is my heart because I just love you know pouring into the young people, and when they get it, I mean, to me that's like a shot in the arm. You know, it's like it keeps me going and keeps me motivated. Um, I'm, I always say that, you know, whenever I'm preaching and teaching or doing anything, you know, uh, I feel that my preaching and teaching is in vain if I cannot connect with someone's soul in that, um, in that moment. Because I feel that, you know, if God has given me an assignment to preach or teach um, or to do whatever, you know, he's doing it for a reason. Um, and that reason is to connect with someone. And whenever I preach or whenever I teach, I do feel the connections from the people um, when, I'm doing, when I'm doing it. And I know that I, I'm connecting because I can look in the audience and see and you, 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 you know, you're a pastor. You can look in the audience to see those who are actually listen and those who are not. Yep. Yep. <laughs> and you can feel those connections. And it's like, you know, I, I'm doing what God has called me to do. But at the same time, that keeps me going. Um, mm -hmm. That and, of course, you know, seeing people come to Christ, seeing people um, just grow in Christ. You know, I've seen some people that were just not close to God at all. They were just the, the most nastiest, downright, <laughs> dirtiest person. And I've seen how God can transform them and just become the most saved, sanctified, Holy Ghost filled, <laughs> fire baptized person. Um, and yes. I just love that. I love seeing the, that type of transformation, that type of change. People that, you know, get on fire and stay on fire. I love it. So, yeah. It's awesome. Awesome. So um, how can, oh, how have you, or I would say, have you ever wanted to quit ministry? And if so, why? I think to be honest, we all have thought, what in the world did we choose? Right. <laughs> <laughs> what, what did God call us to? And we have accepted the challenge. Um, yeah, there's, there's often times where, where, you know, you just, you just look at like, okay, um, I don't know where to go. Mm -hmm. I don't know what to do. And we have to turn back to our call, our assignment and those things. But I can't say that I've ever wanted to just walk out the doors and hand the keys to anybody. <laughs> but there's been days whenever I've been like, man, I don't know if I can take another one of these meetings. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if I can do that personally um, because there's so much pressure. But um, I haven't wanted to hand the keys to somebody, but I, but I definitely have questioned, man, can I do it another day with everything that's going on? Yeah. Um, but then the Lord, man, when we, when we get to those points, we just have to get with the Lord and, and he renews our strength. And, uh, and, and allows us to continue on. I think, I think if anybody would ever, um, you know, somebody may answer this question and say, no, I've never done it. But um, I, I think we've all thought, how, do, how are we going to make it through the day without him? Yes. Uh, you know, because it's, it's not the, the calling to, to do what, what we're doing um, is not for the faint of heart. That's for sure. We see, we see the, the outpouring of that in our, in our, in our scriptures that, um, what it costs to yeah. do it. And, uh, and so, man, it's, it's, it's not, it's not like the get up and go to work every day. And it's just, it's just all peaches and sunshine or whatever, but, um, but it is, it is serving other people and that can be messy, but yeah. I I'm excited to say that uh, anytime I've ever thought, why, well, man, this is tough. He's always been there. He's always sent someone yeah. to give me that word uh, to, to do that. Or he's always put me in a position where I can just be in his presence and, uh, in his presence is fullness of joy. Sometimes you just need joy when you're in ministry. God knows. <laughs> just need joy. <laughs> just need joy. <laughs> joy and peace. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I exactly. Think it's hard to come by, but you yeah, know, I think that, you know, in ministry, you're spot on joy. You know, I believe what gives me joy is, um, of course, you know, seeing people change and all that good stuff, but what gives me joy um, a lot is my family, my kids, and um, just, you know, being there for them. And, and whenever it, I have a hard day um, at work, um, I, I have a nine to five, a regular nine to five. Whenever I have a hard day at work and I just come home and my kids just run into my arm, it's like all the other stuff just like goes away. It's like yeah. all the crap that I went through. <laughs> Does yeah, it exactly. <laughs> exactly. It yeah, matter. totally. <laughs> so, um, so how can someone or how can your why? inspire someone else's um someone else to find their why man i think just just getting into his presence and seeing his transformation in my life if mm -hmm. i if i do what scripture asked me to do and share that with the world then it's gonna inspire other people to get in his presence and find their why and so that's uh 
That's, I guess, the easiest way to say it. Yeah, definitely. Mm-hmm. It's, it's like you said earlier with, you know, out, out of Revelation, you know, we have come by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. And, you know, people are inspired by testimonies. Um, right. That's in this day and age, you know, we love to hear stories of how people have overcame, um, how yeah. people have grown. Uh, mm-hmm. And you mentioned something earlier about your testimony. You said, my testimony is boring. And I feel the same <laughs> way about mine. Mine is not, you know, it's not all great. Like we, <laughs> you know, how you've been in services and you, you've heard the testimonies like, yeah, I was once strung out on drugs and the Lord just cleaned me up. He was like, man, that's pretty cool. Or it was like, I was once a gang baby girl. I was shooting people and, and the Lord just <laughs> suddenly stopped me and said, stop shooting people. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like the, the, the Saul to Paul conversion. <laughs> yeah. But, you yeah. know, you hear those stories, you're like, man, I wish my story was like that. But at the same time, it's like you said, you know, we, we have our own testimony in, in a sense because there are so many people that's just like us. They don't have that same testimony, but they're on fire for the Lord. They love God. Um, but at the same time, you know, they want to know, well, where's my purpose? How can I find any purpose in this if I don't have a testimony? But, you know, I believe that God definitely has kept us from um, a lot of a lot of danger seen and unseen. He's, he's kept us and protected us and, of course, uh, made a way for us to even still be here, all mm-hmm. because of um, his grace, you know, and his mercy and his love towards us. Um, you know, we are fortunate. I, I'm I'm grateful to be in this country. I'm grateful to, um, to be a part of, um, you know, the ministry that I'm in. I'm grateful to be a Christian in this country um, because there are so many places where, you know, if you're a Christian in other areas of the world, you know, you are being persecuted or you are, you know, you don't have the freedom to go and to just worship your hands. I mean, lift up your hands and worship right where you are. You don't even have the, the, the opportunity to have a podcast and talk about the goodness of Jesus, you know, because, you know, as soon as you put that out there, you know, they're <laughs> knocking at your door telling you to take it down and probably trying to kill you. But, you know, we have, we, we're spoiled in this country in a sense, but at the same time, we have um, great freedom and we have um, a lot to be thankful and grateful for because we, we are able to, to express ourselves freely um, in this country, you know, and I'm definitely grateful for that. So, yeah, amazing. Um, we live in a live in an amazing time and an amazing place. We do, we do. It's it's very interesting, but you know, I I truly believe that you know the reason why we're in this time is because you know we we're we're looking at a new generation, a new generation of people who are um, just different. You know, um, I tell them all the time. You know, uh, us millennials, we're different. We're not the same, um, and it takes a lot of um, proving to us to really get it. You know, you have to actually do it with action. You know, you have to prove it to us um, more than just say it. You have to do it. Um, and we're, if you're not going to do it, we're going to do it. <laughs> if you're not yeah. going to take care of it, we're going to take care of it. And you may not like the way we take care of it, <laughs> but it's yeah. going to be done. And that's what you see a lot in today's society. But, um, and a lot of that is misconstrued. And a lot of that is, um, you know, um, has bad intentions too. But, you know, there are a lot of people out here that has good intentions as well. Yep. Uh, how can someone find um, their purpose in God and in life? You know, when you encounter the gospel of Jesus Christ, mm-hmm. um, I truly believe that there is that as he put the Holy Spirit in you, there is a desire to find your purpose. Mm-hmm. And so even from the youngest of ages, there's something as a created human being that is pointing us to our destiny. And so uh, you can go to, we've got a podcast and I, I sort of break this down in the podcast. I know we don't have time here today, but um, we all have a destiny and God gives us dreams that point us to our destiny. And God gives us gifts and talents that lead us to our dreams that allow us to get to our destiny. And we have to go through that path. And so I just, I just say to people, listen, you've got a gift and a talent. What is it? Mm. You've got a dream in your heart. What is it? Mm. And those two things combined together and worked out through time points you directly to your destiny. And so we have to go through that path as leaders. We have to go through that path as believers. And I, and I know that even the things before I was saved and all those things, you know, people that have those powerful testimonies, um, the, you know, the things that they did before that, that they just love to do, that's a part of their destiny, even though now they're transformed. That stuff all leads to where God has destined you to be. And so uh, finding that finding that purpose in life, purpose, destiny, I would say is the same word, but uh, finding that in your life, you got to go all the way back to what do you enjoy doing? What are your gifts and your talents? How does that apply to your dreams that God has put in your heart? And then what, where do those dreams point you? And that's your destiny. And if we can get people to follow that path, if we can help people follow that path, uh, they will find purpose that they 
would far exceed what they uh, what they would ever think about, um, because he's a he's a God who who wants us to achieve far more than what we want for ourselves. I love that. I love that. And, and we can end on that note because I just, I love that. That's a great place to stop. Um, I appreciate you taking this time to speak with me, Pastor Coburn, and, and taking the time out of your day to uh, have this conversation. Um, I'm, I'm super excited to have you on um, and to, um, you know, have you be a part of this ministry and everything that we're doing. You know, I, I greatly appreciate your, um, your, your call to, to, to be a part and your, and your love and your support. Um, and so I'll just leave with this last question is just where can people find you to connect with you and your ministry? Awesome. Yeah, you can find our church. It's the summit Um, and, uh, and you can find us there. We also have a podcast if you're on, uh, if you're on any of the podcasting platforms, which you're probably listening to this show on, yeah. uh, but you can find it. It's called summit up. Uh, and, uh, it's brought to you by the summit in Dover. So we we're just excited to do that. I've got two other things I wanted to mention. Uh, number one, uh, I have a ministry, um, that we are publishing books and doing things all over the world, which is awesome. And then secondly, I started an organization way back, uh, years ago that really hasn't taken off until recently. And it's called America's greatest awakening. And mm. you can find us, uh, you can find our app in the app store. Uh, it's America's greatest awakening. You can just type it in. We're going through a rebranding of all that. So the, it may look different in your app uh, in the next few weeks, but um, we are actually starting, it's called the AGA network. It's America's greatest awakening network. It's Christian and conservative podcasts and, and shows uh, that that are not that are not going to be blocked by by some of the different places out there that are limiting speech right now. So yeah. um, we're super stoked to launch that here at the end of the month. Uh, the AGA Network and America's Grace Awakening dot org. Awesome, thank you. Hey, um, thanks. For I would me. definitely. Um, I want to put that information on uh, um, on my website so that when people listen to um, this show, they're able to connect with you. Uh, they can go directly to the website. Sorry, somebody's cutting grass. <laughs> <laughs> no problem it's all good thanks for having me and uh i look forward to further conversations and Definitely. uh see what see what god's gonna do i Definitely. don't believe that any of this stuff is is coincidence he's got a plan and so uh i'll we'll definitely be talking soon definitely and i appreciate that yeah right. thank you pastor Coburn. okay have a good day take care you, you too